We're looking at Acts 27. We're coming to the end of our studies in Acts. Um, and we're going to look this morning about Paul's journey to Rome and the shipwreck. For those of you who like um, facts and figures, Luke tells us in this story that this was a boat when they get on it and sail um, to, to Italy, that there were 276 on board. Now that's, that's quite a big boat <clears throat> for those days anyhow, not for the current thoughts we have of cruise liners with thousands. 276 means it's quite a big boat. The whole journey took over two years to get from Jerusalem to Caesarea to eventually to Rome. And this was in about AD 59 to 60. So that sets the sort of historical context of what we're looking at. Um, now, just a wee little bit of background to this story. You remember some weeks ago, um, we heard um, Andy talk to us about the, rev the, the results and revolution and things going on in, in Jerusalem. And uh, Paul was rescued, and he then testified before Festus, who took over from Felix as the governor in Jerusalem. And also, he testified before King Agrippa. And as was said afterwards, you know, there was nothing there worthy of his condemnation, but he had appealed to Caesar, and so to Caesar he was go. So he was put in the charge, along with other prisoners, uh, of a centurion who had to find a boat, and then they channel-hopped um, over, you can see there on the map, I think, up to past Cyprus, over to Myra, where they found a boat that was going to uh, Italy and they embarked on that. And we perhaps know the history. If you've got your Bibles and open it to uh, Acts 27, I'm not going to read the whole um, chapter. It's a very exciting chapter, one of the most exciting chapters in the New Testament, I suppose, from an you know, event point of view. It's quite extraordinary. And you'll notice um, Luke uses the word we, so it means that uh, Luke was obviously on board as well. He went through this experience. So he wasn't just gathering information from other people. He lived what he's actually reporting in Acts chapter 27. Well, they board the boat at Mara, bound for Italy. There were many delays, and the weather was deteriorating, and the winter approaching. Now, the boats and the navigation in those days meant that as soon as the weather deteriorated, you just had to stop sailing. It just wasn't safe. And Paul, at that point, warned them. He said, look, I think it's silly to go on. We should spend the winter where we are. But he wasn't listened to, um, and uh, they went on sailing. So when they got um, south of Crete, a sudden northeaster, they call it, a hurricane force wind hit them. And of course, the boat uh, was in severe danger. They had to jettison cargo. And we read in verse 20, we finally gave up all hope of being saved. An impending disaster. So we pick up, and I'm going to read verses 21 to, to 26 of this narrative. After they had gone a long way, a long time without food, Paul stood up before them and said, Men, you should have taken my advice not to sail from Crete. Then you would have spared yourself the damage and loss. But now I urge you to keep up your courage, because not one of you will be lost. Only the ship will be destroyed. Last night, an angel of the Lord, to whom I belong and whom I serve, stood beside me and said, Do not be afraid, Paul. You must stand trial before Caesar. And God has graciously given you the lives of all who sail with you. So keep your courage, men, for I have faith in God that it will happen just as he told me. Nevertheless, we must run aground on some island. And in the following verses, verses 27 to 44, you read the details of the shipwreck. You see the imminent danger they were in. Firstly, the sailors were in danger of absconding with the, uh, the, the boat, the spare boat, the lifeboat they had on board. Uh, and without their skills, the boat would have floundered and they would have all died. And then there was the danger of the soldiers. They said they, they should kill the prisoners. Of course, to the Romans, the prisoners were worth nothing. 
So just to kill them, to get them out of the way, would have been the obvious thing for them to do. But wiser counsel prevailed. The centurion obviously understood that Paul was more than just a prisoner, and uh, he overruled them. And so what happened was that the ship broke up, they ran aground on some uh, sandbanks, but they all managed to reach shore safely. But look at what had happened. There was this big boat, and there's some evidence that the owner of the boat was on board amongst these 276 um, who were sailing in it. That everything, you know, the boat was worth a lot of money. They got a valuable cargo on board. But of course, when you get to this point, the only thing that really matters is human life itself. Everything else, the boat collapses and gets broken up. Um, the cargo has to be shed overboard, uh, overboard. Everything has to go. In extremis, human life matters most. There's one comment I'd like to make on this, and it's an, an interesting one, and I, I was sort of dwelling on it as I was preparing this, that Paul says, you know, men and women, uh, or men, you should have taken my advice and not sail from Crete. It almost sounds to me saying, well, I told you so. <laughs> That's how it might come across. I don't think it is that. I think he's showing, look, I, had, I gave you advice and you didn't take it. So... Because they could see, or the centurion, or the captain of the ship, or whoever was actually in charge at this point, could see that Paul had wisdom in what he was saying. So when it came back, they were willing to listen to what he said. And then he had this amazing revelation. He said, I've heard from God that we're all going to be saved, because God's got in control of me. I've got to get to Rome. I've got to see Caesar. So we're all going to be saved. And they were prepared to listen to him. And I think there's, there's a lesson that we, we need to learn here. And uh, I was reading a commentary and he said this. Um, and how it applies to us, that it's good if we can anchor with our friends and with relatives who don't know Christ, we anchor a point where we're able to share with them that, that we actually believe in Jesus. We believe that Jesus is alive and he's, he lives in us, that God is real. Now, they may think it's rubbish, all right? They may laugh at you and say, well, that's rubbish. But it's so to seen in their hearts, and that later on, when their circumstances change, <clears throat> they may say, well, they know something about God. They seem to have got peace in their hearts. I'll, I'll ask them, well, what is it that makes you different? What is it that gives you faith? There's a reason for them to come back. And one writer says this, we do not fail in our evangelism if we faithfully tell the gospel to someone who is not converted. We only fail if we don't tell the gospel at all. Evangelism itself is not converting people, it's telling them that they need to be converted and telling them how they can be. So let's pray, and I pray right out for all of us, and myself included, that we have the ability to share something of Christ to those around us. It may not have any impact at the time, but later on maybe they'll come back to us and say, look, you know, you've got faith, what does it mean? You know, I, I'm, I'm more interested than I was. The reason I wanted to quote this book to you is that there are a lot of serious thinking as we were thinking the same thing, and maybe our friends, our loved ones, our relatives will be thinking the same thing. And I think it's an important lesson we learn. Holy Spirit, enable us to share the truth so that we can lead to people to Christ. So keep up your courage, men, said Paul, for I have faith in God that it will happen just as he told me. Now, what I want to do now is, is to, just to share with you something about the sea <laughs> and storms. All right? We're looking at one here, um, a disastrous, potentially disastrous storm which destroyed the boat, but they were all, by the grace of God, they were all spared. In my mind, I'm thinking of two other examples in Scripture, and I'm mentioning it now so you can think. Two other examples in Scripture, and there are others, probably more, but I can think of two particularly, where there were storms and God was involved. All right? So there are three points I want to make about the sea and about storms. And that is that the sea, in a sense, represents a hostile environment. We look at the sea, I don't know whether any of you watch it, but there's a series on at the moment, um, Saving Lives at Sea, and the, the Lifeboat Institute, and it's how they rescue people. And 
Anybody who has any experience of the sea will have a healthy respect for it, all right? It can be very calm and wonderful, you can swim in it and so forth, and then a storm comes up and it's suddenly a place of huge danger. If you're a fish, you can have a wonderful time. If you're a human being, you're likely to drown, all right? So, it, it, to me, this represents what life is like. You know, we're, we are pilgrims now, we're Christians, we're pilgrims, we're going through life. Life may be very tranquil and calm, but it has storms. And we also have an enemy who's dead set on killing us. And storms can actually have that effect on us. So storms, they represent something to us. And uh, we're all familiar with this. Maybe we've experienced storms in a spiritual or emotional, physical sense in our own lives. Um, many years ago, Jenny and I were on holiday in, in Italy, and we were on Lake Garda. We were in a ferry boat coming down the, the, from north to the south of the, of the lake. And it was beautiful. And then suddenly, within about five minutes, the clouds had come over, and there was suddenly a, a really quite a violent storm. And the water that had been calm was suddenly really rough. And being a ferry boat, it carried cars, and it was very low. And water was splashing over the front, and it really got quite, quite hairy. <laughs> And the boat suddenly sort of revved up, if that's what boats do, <laughs> and it made for the, for the shores where it was more sheltered. But for about 5, 10, 15 minutes, it, you realised what storms were like, and like lakes and Galilee and so forth. As we know from Scripture, storms come up very quickly and can be potentially very dangerous. But there are other storms in life, aren't there? Years before that experience we had, we... Um, as a family, we just, I just started a new job. Um, we just had our second child. And uh, lunchtime one morning, I went home for lunch, got a busy list of appointments in the afternoon and so forth. The phone went. And I had a, a phone call from somebody who had to tell me that my father had just taken his own life. And you know, it was a sudden storm. And suddenly, everything changed. All the things you relied on and thought were, were safe, permanent, and so forth, suddenly, suddenly disappeared. Just like in this boat, you know, the storm comes and suddenly a boat that looks pretty strong suddenly becomes extremely fragile and starts breaking up. So storms can come. And I've no doubt for some, many of us, if I mention this, it takes you back and you think, well, yes, I, I know that. I, I've known storms. And the first of the examples I want to do, apart from the one we're looking at in Acts 27, the first of the storms I want to look at is recorded in Mark, uh, Matthew 14, when the disciples are in the boat, a storm comes up, they're quite frightened, and then they see Jesus walking on the water. Remember that, that amazing story? And the point I want to make from this analogy is, is very simply this. During storms for us, Jesus comes to us, often walking, walking on water. When I look back to that experience of my father dying um, and all the months that followed uh, of gradually putting things together again and all the walks, looking back, I can see Jesus walking on the water. I can see God active in life. It wasn't very obvious at the time. Faith got very fragile going through those times. And uh, looking back, I say, no, God was there. And in storms, God does come to us. God doesn't change. And I think it's an important lesson for us to learn. Storms will come. We are on water, in a sense, through life. Storms will come. And Paul, you remember um, Peter at that time, got out of the boat and walked on the water towards Jesus. All the time he looked on Jesus, he was walking on water. As soon as he looked at the waves, he began to sink. And that surely is, is a lesson for all of us. Keep your eyes upon Jesus. When we look at the world, when we look at the waves, when we look at all the things that are set against us, we can begin to sink. But once we start looking to Jesus, renewing our faith, renewing our trust in him, believing in him, then we walk on water. 
And the third example I was looking at was way before, and that was Jonah. <laughs> right? Remember Jonah? Jonah had a mandate from God to go and preach to Nineveh. And uh, he gave the thumbs down to God on that one. And he got on a boat, which was going in precisely the other direction. And a storm came up, and they were afraid. And Jonah knew perfectly well what was happening. He said to the sailors, he said, I know why this has come. He said, I'm being disobedient to God. If you throw me overboard, you'll be saved. So after a lot of kerfuffle, they do throw him overboard. The storm relapsed, the boat is saved. But Jonah, <laughs> he's in the water. I don't think Jonah at that point necessarily knew that a fish was going to swallow him. All he knew was, I've disobeyed God, and I'm suffering the consequences. But look what God does. God miraculously provides a whale or a fish or whatever it was, but it, it, it was a marine animal <laughs> which actually saved him. I don't think I would necessarily want to be swallowed by a fish for three days. Um, but it saved his life. And it's, it, it's a wonderful example of how God works. And this seems to teach and, and talk, speak to me about the times when we actually walk in the opposite direction from God, when we're, we're disobedient. Maybe even this morning, perhaps, you feel, well, you know, I, I sense in my heart that I'm disobeying God. I'm not, I'm not walking his way. And uh, the glorious thing about the story of Jonah is that God has amazing ways of coming back to us. He doesn't give, he doesn't give up on us. He could well have said to Jonah, well, look, that's your way. You know, you can suffer the consequences. No, he has a purpose for Jonah. He causes a fish to swallow him, and then he spews him up three days later on the shore, and I probably had a bit of a wash in the sea, I hope, because uh, it can't have been very pleasant. But it, he was restored to fulfill the mission that God had for him. Restoration. Restoration is a wonderful word for us Christians. So often we, 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 get a, we, we get a drift sometimes in terms of God's will and purpose for us. And we feel it in our hearts. Lord, I don't seem to know you as I used to. I feel in some way I'm disobeying you. God in his grace comes to us. He may use all sorts of ways to bring us back, but his love restores us. So the first point that I'm making is the sea with its storms represents a hostile environment, but it doesn't thwart the purpose of God. The second point I want to make is that God is sovereignly in control. Come back to our story in Acts 27 and see what happens. Paul came to understand what was going to happen through an angelic visitation. In Jonah's case, a fish was provided to preserve him. In the case of the disciples, Jesus walked on the water to come back to the boat. On another occasion, he was in the boat and another storm arose and they thought they woke Jesus up and they said, aren't you afraid we're going to perish? And Jesus said, we just, he just said a word and the storm just went like that. That is our God. I have a picture of that man saying, God is God. <laughs> God is God, and he has you in the hollow of his hand. Hallelujah. So God is sovereignly in control of us. And even in the examples I've given, the miraculous way in which he worked in these people's lives should give us confidence to say, that, well, if you can do that to them, he can do that to me. And the third point I want to make is that each of us has a destiny. In the case of Paul, he was to go to Caesar and nothing was going to stop it. It took two years, it took a long sea journey, it took a shipwreck, but eventually he got there. God has his purpose and God will not be thwarted. There's a lovely song which um, Mark Altrogi wrote some, some years ago. He wrote some wonderful songs, actually, but um, I'm just going to quote this one. I have a destiny I know I shall fulfill. 
I have a destiny in that city on a hill. I have a destiny and it's not an empty wish, for I know that I was born for such a time as this. Long before the ages you predestined me to walk in all the works you have prepared for me. You've given me a part to play in history, to help prepare a bride for eternity. I did not choose you, but you have chosen me and appointed me for bearing fruit abundantly. I know that you will complete the work begun in me by the power of your spirit working mightily. They're wonderful words. And uh, I, can, I can remember, we haven't sung it for a long time actually, but it, it still retains to me its, it's, it's, it's glory. Um, but I think that there's a problem here. You can look at the story of Paul and you say, well, yeah, he was a great man of God. He was, he was, he was amazing. He was sort of League One. Um, you know, I'm, I'm down here in the, 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 the third division of the school thing, you know, in comparison, I'm just right down here. I'm just an ordinary person. How can you compare? It's all right for somebody like Paul to say, I have a destiny I can fulfill. You know, God, an angel came to me and said, you've got to go to Caesar. Ship let me blow. You've got to go to Caesar. And Caesar, you will go. You say, but, but is that true of me? Can I honestly say I've got a destiny I shall fulfill? Well, I think the simple answer in the scripture answer is yes. Yes, yes, yes. Each of us has a destiny in God. Each of us has a purpose in life. Each of us has that which God wants us to do. And sometimes it's not clear. Sometimes we, 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 we veer different ways, but God will have his purpose in us. And I say this this morning to, to, to encourage us. We can often say, if I had a visitation, if I could only have an angelic visitation, you know, if you're, if you're younger, and I say this to those of you who are just wondering how your life is going to map out, you say, well, if only I could have some sort of angelic visitation. <laughs> you know, an angel comes and says, well, no, this is what you're going to do. I could, I could cope with that. But, you know, I just feel at sea. I feel as if, you know, I'm, I'm, my mind is wandering in all sorts of different ways, and I don't seem to have any clarity. Well, my encouragement to you would be just... Keep on seeking the face of God. He has a wonderful way of leading us. He also has a wonderful way of correcting our mistakes. Jonah made a bad mistake, all right? He made a wrong choice. And he paid a penalty in the sense that he had just jumped overboard. He cast himself on God. That's basically what he did. And I suggest there are times when we need to cast ourselves on God and say, Lord, I'm trusting you. I'm trusting you. The ship can break up, the cargo can be thrown overboard, but life is important. And God, you know, you've made me, you saved me by Christ, you've got a purpose for me. Now, Lord, I need to hear from you what I'm to do in this circumstance or with my life, whatever it is. Is God really interested in little old me? Well, I say to little old you, yes, absolutely. You're not little in the place of God. You know, it's a human thing to categorize people. We all do it. You know, we put people in, in, in different compartments in life. And it's often that, you know, there's some people who are right up there, they're world famous and so forth. And then there's just ordinary plodders like us. You know, we plod through life. We don't seem to have any great significance. You know, it's and not many people have heard of us and so forth. And that's how we sort of think about people. I want to suggest that God is very different from that. God views every life as precious. You know, Jesus so loved you that he came to earth to die for you. He didn't just die for all these others and just include you as an afterthought. He said, for me and for you, for each one of us, Jesus saw us saw us in our, in our sin, and he came to earth, he died, he gave his life so that we might come back to God. We are very significant to God. There's no such thing as anybody being insignificant. You know, I think of those, we were thinking about the persecuted church, and uh, 
I was thinking of those Christians in North Korea, you know, with nothing, absolutely nothing. Even their own children are likely to, 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 to report them if they think that they're reading a Bible or singing a Christian song or something like that, you know. And if they're found, they go to a labor camp. And if they go to a labor camp, they will die. And yet, there are thousands, as we saw, thousands of Christians. And they're precious to God. I sense, I sense that they know more about the love of Jesus in their lives for their short Christian lives before they're martyred than we can ever understand. You know, God loves his saints. He loves his martyred saints. He loves those who trust him. He loves us. He loves us. And I'm going to leave you with one last thought, um, and that's from Hebrews. And it's a wonderful promise that the writer of Hebrews gives us. He says, I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. So that we may say with confidence, the Lord is my helper. I will not be afraid. What can man do to me? And you can perhaps insert in there, what can man do to me? What can the sea do to me? What can storms do to me? What can ill health do to me? What can, what can anything do to me? God says, I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. You know, sometimes we can, we can often feel forsaken by God. You know, circumstances can be such that we, there seems to be such a cloud over God. We know probably he's up there somewhere, the sun is shining out there, but there's such a thick cloud bank that I can't feel him, I can't see him, and I feel bereft, I feel cast adrift. God says, I will never leave you. I can remember going through a time of quite acute depression once, didn't last mercifully very long, but when I look back, one of the things that helped me most was the rock of Scripture. When you looked at Scripture, and this is what God says, I will never leave you. <laughs> you know, we are more than conquerors through Christ. And that's what the Word of God says, and the Word of God is like a rock. And you, you, in your confusion, you get to stand on that and say, well, I don't understand, I don't feel it, but I'm standing on the rock, I believe the truth. And God then shines through that truth and the sun begins to come through the cloud and you begin to feel him again and put your hand in his. That shipwreck, it's all very well to, to read about it. I think 276 people on board and all were saved. It must have been a horrendous occasion, quite horrendous. And although Paul had that confidence, you must think that sometimes you think, well, you know, did God really say that? Did the angel really say that? You know, look at what's happening. Like Peter on the water, he says, you know, well, the reality is the waves are around me. This is what's really happening. But no, what really was happening was Jesus was walking on the water. That was true reality. So let's, as Christians, realize what the true reality is, not the circumstances that appear to be real around us, but the certainty of God's word the certainty of his truth, and that will encourage us, that will bring us through. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we, we do thank you for your grace, the richness of your truth. Thank you even this morning, Lord, for speaking to us and for coming and praying and healing, worshipping you, sensing your presence amongst us. Oh, Lord, we, we thank you. Thank you for your word too, Lord, which teaches us so much, shows us all these various stages and aspects of human life and how you enter our experience, our world, and how gracious and how merciful you are. Lord, I pray you'll continue your work of healing amongst us. Continue your work of grace. Lord, we want to be strong in the faith. We want to be those who can stand up to the wiles of Satan, those, Lord, who can Fulfill the destiny you have for us. So Lord, we ask, Holy Spirit, that you will open our eyes of understanding, keep our ears open to what you're saying, our eyes upon you. And Lord, we just want to say thank you for who you are, who you're making us, what we shall be one day in glory. Amen. Amen. Mm -hmm.